mein Gott, was ist denn? Ah, now. Go live. Okay, folks. We are back, uh, back at our live session here. It's been a while since the last session. Um, we were pretty busy with uh, some projects and one of them we are talking about this evening. Therefore, we have invited our friend Jens Unger from Berlin, Germany, who um, built an observatory with us. And that's also the main topic of, of this evening. And I'm really happy that we are again here in our round. Um, so. I will do it a bit different than the other times. Um, I have three pictures from our guests, from our viewers that I will show you in the, yeah, now to the start of the session. And then we will talk about our remote astronomy. And after us, uh, we will also give uh, Peter the stage because he can uh, tell us some more uh, information about remote observatories in the Cedarberg Observatory in South Africa. Uh, yeah, so without further ado, let's get started with our guest pictures. Um, oh, folks, that you can also see it. I will share my screen, of course. And this is this one. So I bring up the first picture here. Can you see a heart? Okay, <laughs> nodding. Um, this and I will give you also some some details about this shot. This is from George, from Greece. He took this shot um, last year. He wrote me an email in addition to this shot. Uh, with a, it's taken with an Orion uh, eighty millimeter refractor at f6.25 with a Canon EOS 600 on a Vixen equatorial mount with an astronomic CLS filter and it's a total of three hours integration time processed with, with a long list of software. I can't, can't repeat this, all the software parts here. I, mostly PixInsight I see and Photoshop. Yeah, and here we have a wonderful heart. The next shot is, yeah, that's also a pretty awesome thing. That's the Lagoon Nebula. And this is from Julian. Um, to be honest, he sent me this shot while we uh, had our last session uh, back in August last year. So this is just as a wrap up here. Um, I had this already. Uh, or oh, I had this still on the on the hard drive, and I will show this also to you. Um, taken with a CT10, I think that's uh, I don't know the manufacturer. Um, that's the Newton from Orion Optics. Orion, yes, Newtonian telescope, ASI 2600 mm, and three and a half hours HOO RGB, and that's pretty awesome. Also, processing is really nicely done not over not overdone it pretty cool so thank you already for sharing this image and the last one from our resident Renny Bonder Hoffman from uh, Denmark that is the um, let's say upper part of the question mark nebula in Kifius and it is the, taken with his TS Optics 100 APQ or 100Q APO on a ZWO AM5 mount and with Antlia filters and a ZWO 2600 MC Pro. And do I see the integration time? 13 hours integration time. Whoa, okay. That's pretty deep. And also nice processing, I have to say. That's really cool. Nice structures here. It's uh, difficult to frame this up because it's just so large. So thank you all for your submissions. And 
I like to see more of you, so feel free to send us more shots. Okay, and now we come to the main part of this evening. And we don't see a slide here. That's not working. Just a moment. Okay. That's not what I expected. No, just dark. Okay. Unfortunately, I think we have to do it this way because when I started as full screen, then it's just black. So, and I will remove them here. So, you guys can can you see my my screen? Okay, thumbs up. Great. Give it a bit more space. Okay, so for me, for some words as an introduction here, um, I will give then the stage to to the other guys. Um, back in last year, we uh, um, thought about the idea uh, setting up a remote observatory. Um, how we came to this day, uh, to this uh, point, we will uh, then discuss also more in detail, and we want to show you what yeah what was needed to to come to from the idea as i uh, as i wrote here from the idea to set up such an observatory to the real process of operation uh, which was a uh, pretty uh, stunning experience i have to say um that was super cool and in the following let's say hour we want to uh, give you some details about the idea that we had how we found each other that was also pretty cool how we plan uh, what to set up where to set up how we prepared everything um, and what was also needed this was this is uh, of course the testing um, shipping is also an adventure ship something uh, outside the european union um, we had some uh, yeah let's say issues with that um, yeah, what we had to do for installation, we were there, we were in Namibia where we set up the observatory, set up, set it up all by ourselves. Um, yeah, and we can also show you some results that we have already. It's not, not too much because yeah, currently there's rain season. So even there it's cloudy sometimes. So we, we can't use every night. Okay, um, the first part, who are we? Uh, you all know me here from the live stream, um, but the other guys um, are also pretty interesting people. And so I will give the word to Sophie first. She can uh, tell us a bit more about us. Yeah, uh, uh, thank so you, Thorsten. Sophie, just t let me know when I should uh, switch to to the next slide then. I will do this. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so first off, a little bit of backstory. So about a year ago, a little bit more than a year, year ago, I think it was December um, 2022. That's when um, Jens and me, we are pretty active in a Discord server called Dark Matters Astro. And well, we both talked about our idea of um, or our dream of having a remote observatory because the weather back then in December just like every year was pretty awful and yeah well for some reason um, well we talked about this and uh, we talked to each other and we found out that both of us we pretty much have a similar mentality when it comes to astro we are on a very well we both are um, pretty crazy, I'd say. 
<laughs> and how we have crazy ideas and we push through them. And well, we quickly noticed that we somehow fit together very well. And we both had the same idea or dream. So it didn't take long until, well, we had everything together for our first shared remote observatory. I mean, we didn't know each other for more than two months uh, before setting up in Spain. And honestly, it was one of the best decisions I've made last year or two years ago, <laughs> because I was setting the first stone for a big adventure. And while we were in Spain, we already we saw the big, I mean, you can see it in the picture, maybe behind um, Jens and myself, there's uh, the big CDK. Well, you only can see the mount, but there's a CDK in the back. And we already talked about, yeah, well, now we're here, what's next? Um, do we want to get a bigger scope? <laughs> and what do we do? And at first, it might have seemed like we were joking, <laughs> but <laughs> well, we didn't, obviously. <laughs> And um, we set up a plan for a second observatory. Uh, <laughs> well, um, at first it seemed very far away because uh, we just put all of our best equipment together, put into Spain, and we didn't have much left. Like everything you see on the picture in Spain, like the mount, um, that was the mount I used at home. The scope is from Jens. It's his go-to scope. Well, it, it was at home. Um, so we put all of our best equipment together to form this. And so we didn't have much left, but we didn't want to let go of this idea. And we kept thinking about it. And we went um, from the idea of owning a CDK, which is pretty expensive to down um, to owning um, our RC. I, I don't want to pronounce the whole name. <laughs> so yeah, we thought about setting up a 12 inch RC and well, um, I remember asking in our TS group uh, if the 12 inch is a good scope, if it's um, fine for using remote. And then Torst said, yeah, he has the scope. He loves it. It's pretty good, but it's hard to collimate. And well, <laughs> Jens and me, we both don't know how to collimate on our seat, but Torst did. So I just asked him, hey, do you want to set up um, a remote observatory with us and well he didn't say no so that was pretty good so I asked Jens if it's fine if he well might expand our group and uh, maybe try our next project as three people and he also was pretty happy about it so well we put everything together and now um, well we are here Thorsten, Jens and me together as a team and well we both managed to well, make our dream come true, I'd say. So, yeah, that's that's the backstory of it. And it's pretty amazing. Um, uh, uh, the time in Namibia was great. So one of the best experiences I've, I've had. So thank you, Jens and Thorsten. It was really fun together with you. But now let's talk about why we did this, because that's what I didn't mention so far, except <laughs> that we are pretty crazy. <laughs> but um, yeah, well, okay, I, I did mention the weather. The weather is, well, as you might know, in Germany, it's pretty bad in winter. And also in summer, it's not always that good. And well, when you, you're really invested in a hobby and you want to dive into it, get your images, or just like me, find new things, new discoveries where you need lots of integration times. Seeing a weather forecast like the one on the left is, well, kind of heartbreaking, I'd say. So moving to a location with the weather forecast like it's on the right <clears throat> was the next logical thing to do. And what what's also really important is um, not just good weather, but also very dark skies. And in Spain, we are at bottle three, so it's pretty dark already, but Namibia has no light pollution at all where we are, it's bottle one. So not only you have those many clear nights where you can get your data, you also have really, really good data with less noise and good well, good signal to noise ratio. So yeah, um, also uh, Namibia, well, I think we, we talk about Namibia as a location later again, so I don't want to 
talk too much about it. Or am I wrong, Thorsten? Uh, yeah, you, we, we can just mention the, the two more points that are pretty interesting for Namibia or also other uh, locations, which is the, the dry weather um, and also the, the high altitude that we have. We, uh, I personally was not really aware of that, that we are that high with 1,800 meter, uh, which is also pretty nice to have um, because then we, you have less atmosphere uh, above the scope, which makes the atmosphere even clearer yeah maybe you should add how how we got aware of this high attitude yeah i was thinking about that too we were, we yeah. have um like, <laughs> i think two minutes walk to yes. the observatory from our or maybe even three or That's more right. from our bedrooms to the observatory and every time we walked there we, we were out of breath and we're like yes come on why is this so exhausting to get there and then The, uh, well, we learned about our high altitude and well, there's not yes. that much air to breathe, so it all made sense. Exactly, yes, that's right. So we learned it the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Sophie, very much. Um, the next point uh, that we can uh, talk about is the planning. Uh, how we, uh, yeah, what is needed to, to prepare uh, yourself for such an adventure and uh, such a project. Jens, if you would mind, take over. Yeah, so for the planning, actually, that was, um, we all love good planning. So what we did, we opened a Discord server and we started like putting everything down, uh, talking about, I don't know if we really already honed in into the location, Uh, we were also, mm -hmm. I think, brainstorming no. about the location, where and what equipment and the timeline. And we wrote tons of documents, equipment lists, and uh, uh, which was all great. But we, we, you get stuck somewhere, right? And then we started to really write uh, what location is good, where we can reach out. And uh, we were lucky enough to... Um, so we re don't, didn't reach out only to Harkos. We reached out to, to many But uh, the feedback from Harkos was so far the best um, for us, uh, not for everyone. And they had one spot free with a full dome. And we were like, okay, dome is already nice because what we had in Spain is uh, shared roofs and a roll-off roof. Yeah. So we did, we fixed then on the location and step-by-step uh, -step on the equipment and then on the timeline. So what, what we can tell is the planning was, uh, it, it sounds like, hey, We we know the gear, we know the location, let's go. Actually, it took us many, many Discord calls and emails. I think I think we had every week at least one, if not two, for half a year. And it sometimes got so crazy, we had like, <laughs> it fits like every hour. A call. <laughs> so in the end, basically, we totally underestimated the, uh, the effort in order to make a remote observatory. Maybe show the next slide. Yes. So, and then, um, yeah, where to go was pretty easy, I would say, because there are not many options for astrophotography um, because you need safe infrastructure. On the other hand, you don't need too much infrastructure because then you have light pollution. It needs to be mm. a safe country, politically stable, um, crimin uh, yeah, not much criminality in this area and stuff like this. So if you do a do all these factors, you, you don't, you are not left with much countries, right? And Chile and Namibia are sort of proven in astrophotography. So this is where we honed in. Australia was a bit too far. US, um, too expensive. And also we were thinking of, hey, what about Southern Hemisphere? Uh, would be great because we don't know this guy there at all. So Namibia was quickly well chosen and had many um, advantages. There, especially, there are already some um, astro farms there, so you, you, you there, there's basically uh, a precedence, and you have on-site support. It's proven location, so that was pretty quick. And also, uh, Harkos is close to the Namib Desert, which is one of the driest desert um, uh, there is. Uh, so they don't have much, um, yeah, moist or particles in the sky. May next mm -hmm. slide. Yes. So then 
the location was chosen, then we went basically, what do we actually want to do? Uh, what what are our goals? And there we were a little bit complementary. So we didn't have all the same goals because everybody wants to do something else. Sophie, for instance, is very famous for her discoveries and planetary nebulars. So she's happy with a scope that constantly looks at O3 and different spots of the sky uh, and more wide field. And Torsten and me were more crazy about uh, galaxies that are in irregular shape. Um, so we, we said, okay, then quickly came to like, we need to do a setup, right? Because we, we have these two different goals, but still we want to do it together and we have common projects. So we came up with this dual setup, a wide field scope, basically on top of the RC. And uh, we wanted to use as much test equipment, but in the end we figured, ah, there are so many new cool filters out there. <laughs> so um, uh, we, we went also a little bit explorative. Uh, with our selection, basically with stuff we have never touched before, because we figured for the RC we need a we need nine uh, position filter wheel because we went for the dark series uh, for LRGB R plus. Um, for some of you who don't know, dark series is basically it doesn't do the cutoff like for light polluted areas in the yellowish part. Um, it actually goes over, so you get much more signal. Uh, with these filters and R plus is more reaching into the infrared. So uh, with that, you needed already five, then you need the SHO. And one spot we needed a, a dark, uh, what do you say? Uh, like an ND filter or like a black filter for making bias. Yeah, it's black filter, yeah. So black just filter, a yes. black cap, basically. Yeah. So, and with that, we needed to change already the whole image train, which uh, Torsten had before because uh, the thickness difference, the OEG needed to be integrated then into the filter wheel, which uh, Starlight Express had, luckily, and stuff like that. I don't want to go into details, but in the end, we had a mix of uh, well-tested equipment and a bunch of non-tested equipment. So uh, you see down there the solution, um, uh, which we went with. Uh, the mount, we uh, discussed it. You can discuss forever which mount yeah. to take, right? <laughs> So in the end, we went for 10 micron, it was uh, proven, uh, but you can go with any other good ones, but uh, that's a long discussion and it needs to hold it. 10 micron for us was good because of shipping. So basically uh, the 10 micron GM2000 you see here, you can take it apart into two separate pieces and put it in two luggage pieces. You will see it later in the picture. Um, which is good for shipping when you go when you don't want to uh, ship it via FedEx or something else because it's heavy mount so it will add a lot of cost uh, to your shipping. So we decided we take it with us on our flight. We will show you also some more details later on of of this yeah. uh, of the luggage that was pretty impressive. Yeah. So okay, so maybe Torsten, you want to take the next slide? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Timeline. Um, the yeah, our timeline. So this is not the theoretical timeline. This is the really uh, the real timeline that we had. <laughs> so um, we started in as said in uh, summer last year with uh, with the idea, the planning. Uh, we could do some things in parallel. So uh, planning and ordering, of course, we had to order, for example, Starlight Express stuff comes directly from Great Britain. So we had uh, this long process of ordering from non-EU states, which took already weeks and also all the other things, adapters and so on. Um, the Eagle, as so, uh, I'm, I'm going a bit forward. Uh, we will show you also then a list of the equipment later on. So we ordered all these things that we uh, were able to uh, had to set all up in in theory before, and that was done. Then here in, in the end of August, uh, I collected all these things together here uh, in Saxony. So and we set it up all the equipment we had to this day. There was, I uh, believe, some things we are still missing then, so it was just a dry test to see that everything works, especially, for example, the balance, that we don't miscalculated our counterweights and that everything could be put on the 10 micron mount, which is, to be honest, 
uh, at their limit. There is um, the 10 micron is stated with 50 kilogram payload. I think we carry something short around 40. But with this high, with this big telescope, this huge arm uh, that is uh, creating these forces, it's pretty at its limit. And we also said, as you as we mentioned before, that EDPH, that refractor on top for the wide field shots. So it's pretty impressive setup. So this testing was definitely needed. Unfortunately, I hadn't the time and also not the, the space here in my backyard to set up an amount and let it just uh, out in the field for, for some days. So we decided to carry all these things uh, down to Sophie, to Bavaria and um in their location, she set up, set it up all these, uh, things again, then complete as a complete setup with the Astro PC, with the refractor on top. And there we were able to do the first test shots. And there went out, I think, pretty uh, amazing. It was, it was just working. It was, uh, yeah, let's say not the r most rigid assembly, I would say, but, uh, it worked pretty well. And with this uh, second testing phase, we were also more confident that, that everything will work when we uh, bring it down to Namibia. And this, so we thought. So we thought, yes. <laughs> In theory, everything was cleared at this, uh, at this date. So we were really happy about it. And then came the shipping. So uh, Jens already mentioned it. Um, we, want to we wanted to save costs. Uh, when it is possible and this mount yeah it's just you you can carry it in your luggage in the plane it's still very heavy you need many boxes but it is possible with the rc on the other hand is this is not working because this is a really large crate that you have to to carry around this is only possible or it is more easy with a professional uh, shipping company and the the owners of the farm uh, yeah sent us a name of a company where we uh, get in contact with and these guys uh, yeah they just organized the pickup and the carrying uh, it took three flights i think it were there was three flights for the scope to arrive in Namibia and then a very rough uh, car transport to the farm. But yeah, it arrived there. It was working in some way, but it was a real adventure with some uh, yeah uh, issues in between. Unfortunately, it took a very long time to do this telescope shipping. So luckily we, we shipped it, I think, three weeks before. No, that's not enough. Four weeks before we went down there and it arrived together with us. So yeah, that took some time. Yeah, and then... You, you have to say that the logistic companies told us it takes only five to eight yes, days. They, to they, go down, uh, and in the end, it took four weeks. So if, if you do your own observatory shipping... It's not as reliable as you think. It's not like DHL Express. It's like do it way ahead of time. So for us, it came even three days after we arrived. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You guys had someone to to take the package or to accept the package when it arrived, or are you counting <laughs> that, on to that's that's get more it yourself? that's more difficult. Um, in Namibia, you don't have a postal service especially not to the farms in in Windhoek or in the big cities yes there is postal service but not to these farms the farm owners or the the, the receptionist has to carry up the, the the packages in the capital and so they just got informed uh, here you have something to pick up and then you have to go there and pick it up and uh, the farm owners um did this so this was just a the very short uh, very short explanation in detail it was a bit more complicated but yes the biggest problem was that um we had a guaranteed chip or that's what is guaranteed um they told us eight max of eight days shipping time yeah and then it was that long that was uh yeah could be a real issue so we uh 
I think when we did this testing phase, we, we planned our trip down there and we, yeah, we, we thought December would be okay. That would be just before the rain season, hopefully. But we didn't expect to do a very, yeah, any pretty pictures in that phase. We just needed some clear sky to do the polar alignment and to do all the, the other stuff focusing and so on. So December, uh, was a, yeah, let's say good idea. And yes, we had the whole week. I would say the whole week clear sky. Maybe one night was not perfect, but, uh, the other days were, were great. So, yeah, but you can imagine that two days before our flight went, we were not sure if there's a pier or not a telescope arriving. In yes. So, so we the nervous, let's say it this way. The, the, the mindset between Namibia, even when there are German people, uh, the mindset is just different to us, very different. And yeah, now we are aware of that. But uh, back these days, uh, we had, yeah, we were struggling pretty heavily. So we, we asked permanently via WhatsApp or, or other, other uh, ways, uh, how is the status? Um, is everything prepared for us? And yeah, yeah everything works. Everything is okay. Um, and when we arrived there, it was not okay. So we had still much work to do. We will uh, show you later some of the problems we had. But overall, we had a dome where we could put our things in. So that's just uh, the, the, the very shortest way. We were successful in the end. This is also why here is uh, the, the last box here is the usage. So we can use the scope now. We were able to set up everything. Okay, now I was a bit uh, ahead, unfortunately. We have here, just in addition, uh, two of our, the first testing phase, this was this dry testing here inside the room. So uh, just setting everything up, which I mentioned, and here in Sophie's backyard, uh, the whole setup here, you can see the 10 micron. Um, Jens uh, also uh, had a, ordered a Berlebach uh, tripod that we are able to set it up because in Namibia, of course, we have a pier, but to, to do the, te the test here in Germany, we had to buy an additional tripod. You still have it, Jens? What, what do, are you I doing? I own it, but, but Sophie has it. Yeah, it's still here. Ah, okay. Okay. Now you need uh, another mount which you can put on that fat <laughs> Berlebach <laughs> tripod. <laughs> yeah, and then here... The, here's also the image train completely assembled with focuser, filter wheel, camera rotator, and so on. Everything is uh, set up here. Okay. Some details about the installation. Oh, yeah, the, the transport, of course. That's here. Um, this is our luggage. So we had 132 kilogram of luggage in our, in the plane. This was only possible because we were four people flying and every, everyone has two luggages with 20, 23 kilogram max. Uh, that was the only way to carry all these things. So all the, the imaging trains, the APO, the 10 micron here in these metal boxes, is everything here and also counterweights we carried also 40 no 20 kilogram of counterweights um with us uh pretty uh, uh pretty heavy stuff <laughs> and of course you need for a week in the desert you need also some clothes and so on and be prepared for nasty questions at the uh tsa or at the travel security yes the exactly agency. They're looking at counterweights and, and, and stuff, and they were like, what the hell is going on here? And and the uh, Howie Glatter laser. Yes. The, laser. The, uh, I don't know if you know how a gl Howie Glatter laser looks. That's uh, just a polished aluminum thing with a button on the top, and that looks just like uh, yeah, some sort of explosive. And <laughs> there were some questions. But yeah, we are, we are here again, so... No, no jail, something. <laughs> yeah. And here on the right side, um, which I mentioned before, this is the box from, from the RC. And this is, I think, before shipping, right? 
Yeah, this is before shipping because yes. the box after shipping looked very different. Exactly. <laughs> it was, it was exactly. nearly destroyed. Yeah. The, so the, the box and also the scope suffered pretty heavily from this transport. So we all know um, shipping a telescope is pretty, uh, yeah, pretty difficult because the, yeah, you have to handle it carefully. So we taped it around with this uh, attention uh, tape here, but yeah, nobody cares. Uh, yeah, it's lesson learned next time we ship in a wooden box. And yes. Not in the original one. <laughs> Definitely. Or there's maybe some sort of double packing or something like that. Uh, we believe that they dropped something onto the telescope. So we had this styrofoam inside and it was just broken. It was broken to pieces. Um, that was not that good. Thankfully, the optics were okay and also mechanics. So there was no damage to it, but it was, I think, at the limit. It was really scary seeing the box for the first yes, time. Yes, yes. And we also, we, we filmed the opening that we can ensure that not we had destroyed something. We want just some sort of uh, proof uh, what happened there. But yeah, it went out all good in the end. Yeah, when we were there, this is the next uh, slide, um, which was pretty interesting to see it here as in this uh, chart. Uh, when we were there for this week of installation, so we had one week uh, saved for that uh, for the whole installation phase. Um, this was the distribution of our tasks that we had to do. So the setup and the cabling was just straightforward we three all know exactly what to do we were confident now you know um th did this uh, many times before so that was not a real issue but then all the minor other things uh kicked in and we had also in the end i think we there comes a list of problems that we had when installing uh, that system so that was also a lesson learned uh, you have to calculate much more time for just unforeseen things and there are so many of them things that went good hundreds of times before and you're in your own backyard when going abroad going uh, in the desert something went just wrong and you have to deal with it and thankfully um, i think we were all very professional and found a solution for every problem that we were facing. That was super cool. That was also one of the best experiences I, I had there that we, we saw a problem and yeah, let, let's go fix it. That was so cool. But yeah, the, the list will come in just a couple of minutes. But, but we, we need to mention that six days means really you're not 24 seven there at uh, 24 hours awake, but we were 16, sometimes yeah. even 18 hours non-stop working on this yeah so it was it was ludicrous and especially <laughs> towards the end i mean when we thought we had done it was our last day we just wanted to check out if it's loose <laughs> and then we call it a day and we go home everything went to shit but yes. <laughs> later uh, that was the moment where we thought okay maybe you should give up yeah yeah <laughs> that's that's right that's very true um yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you need to be prepared so basically if you plan a remote observ observatory this is why we do this time distribution there, no, never underestimate even if you have a totally proven well-known uh, concept there are always some other elements you you didn't thought of and uh, it drove us crazy how many problems occurred and we were three experienced astrophotographers uh, we are, and we had already a remote observatory but there's always something coming uh, in Jurassic Park. They always say nature finds a way. <laughs> yeah. It will always find you. Yes, on foot. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay, so um, let's go a bit more in detail about this installation phase. Um, when we arrived there, the dome. So we were the first. Uh, yeah, not owners, but we rented the dome at first. There was nobody before us inside. So the dome was just empty. 
and I, there was I used to say they build it for us so yes <laughs> yeah that's a, that's a good uh, a good thought that's right um so the first thing we had to do we had to mount our pier so um the dome was empty without a pier because the owners uh they just don't know what equipment you want to set up uh, for example our neighbor has a uh, a very big plane wave mount, which comes to a very different position than a normal German equatorial mount. So it's just empty. And we constructed this pier before and they had produced the, the pier in Namibia, which was super cool. It was there on time. No problem. Uh, we just had to bolt it uh, to the ground. Um, yeah, that sounds wrong. Uh, the, it's not really the ground. They have a, a foundation uh, made of concrete they're a very big foundation capable of carrying nearly any load you can imagine so no problem with that that was decoupled from the dome absolutely professional and yeah it is a scope dome uh, don't know if you know the P a polish company a three meter scope dome pretty cool thing normally the problem uh, as mentioned we had to uh, fix some things on the dome. So the power cabling had to be done and also it was not adjusted uh, because it was not powered before. Nobody could test it and the gears were just not fitting properly. So we had to fine tune the dome that is working properly. Another big part is also the balancing. You can, you have to balance the whole setup as good as possible because otherwise the mount will yeah, just have problems uh, turning properly around. And you can do the balancing only if the whole setup is complete. Even a, a small addition like a finder scope or something will change that balance. So we had to set up all the things before, do this balancing, do the polar alignment. Of course, as good as possible because we are not there anymore, so it's at least not planned. We had to do a very good polar alignment and route all the cables. That was also a pretty uh, impressive thing, uh, which thankfully Sophie did in a perfect way, I would say, uh, doing the cabling that nothing gets stuck when the telescope turns. Imagine a meridian flip, if you know what I'm talking about. You know, all the cables just went 180 degrees, and you have to ensure that nothing will, yeah, sag in, in any, uh, at a screw or something like that. And here we have some impressions. So uh, also network. Here you see Jens doing network cabling. Um, we have to ensure a proper access, a very reliable access to all the parts. And we are talking about many parts uh, with such an observatory that everything works well over time without permanent restarts or something. That's an early picture. I was still smiling. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And in the end, we are also smiling. But in the meantime, well, yeah. Uh, interesting uh, side note here. You see the alignment here. This is the this is the ready or the, the estimated polar alignment. Uh, we have uh, twenty three degree of of height of the South Celestial Pole in Namibia, which is for a European guy. This just looks wrong uh, when the mount is pointing so low, just above the horizon. And here in the upper right, we used a sharp cap for the for the polar alignment, and you see the results were yeah good. <laughs> Fixing the dome, this picture here, and here on the lower right, you see uh, the first our first impression of the southern night sky, which was a really awesome feeling. Uh, just. Let me just quickly show you, if you are not aware of of the southern sky, let me just quickly show you what you can expect. Um, just a moment. I have some struggles here with that screen. This is just Solarium Web. I just want to show you quickly how the sky is looking currently. So this is uh, the live view. 
and well, we'll also blend in the equatorial grid. So here is the South Celestial Pole. And you see the North Celestial Pole that you are used to see from the Northern Hemisphere is just below the horizon. And that leads to an interesting effect that that constellations will stand up uh, head over heels. Here, for example, Orion looks completely um, awkward. <laughs> so uh, we had... We needed some time to get used to that view of the night sky. And also for us, really new constellations. Uh, if you're not aware of the southern sky, if you've never been there, there are constellations you are just uh, completely new. And for example, for me, I'm doing this for more than 20 years now. I've never seen these constellations before. That was uh, a really epic feeling. And this was in the, in the first night we just stand out outside the dome, looked in the sky, and were stunned all over the place. And then you see also some, uh, yeah, you think, well, are there clouds in the sky? That can't be possible. No, these are, yeah, there are clouds, but it's the large and the small Mag Magellanic cloud. So they were super easy, visible with the naked eye. That was Really? That was really crazy, actually, because yeah. usually when you look down at your phone, um, your eyes are adjusted to the darkness. When you look up again, you don't see anything. But I was looking at my phone. I looked up and I was still, still um, LMC and SMC. They were so bright. You couldn't miss them. That was so crazy. I couldn't believe that. <laughs> That's right. Yes, yes, exactly. And... Uh, but the, the cool thing about this location is you are not so far to the south as you are to the north on the north celestial uh, on the north, northern hemisphere. So you can see also the the usual um, northern constellations. Not not very high, of course not. But you can also see. Yeah, let me just zoom zoom out here a bit and go a bit to the north. Uh, Kefius here, Perseus, Triangulum, Andromeda. You can also see Andromeda in the sky. That's no, no problem. And that's very cool also for us that we can also shoot some northern sky targets because we are used to them. So that was just a quick um, quick explanation of the sky that, uh, that I wanted to, to give you all. And I will just quickly check out no comments so far if uh, you have any questions out there feel free send us uh, a message here in the chat then we can answer these otherwise I will go forward to a very yeah <laughs> I don't know how, how to explain what you see here that is our electrical connection plan that we prepared before uh yeah, when we were in the planning phase, that was the outcome, one of the outcomes of our planning phase. Jens, w would you mind uh, yes. talking a I bit about this? Okay. Yes. My favorite slide. So yeah. <laughs> like we were laying out every single cable uh, that is needed, meaning uh, electrical cable, data cable, network cable, whatever cable is needed, um, it's in here. So this is basically our blueprint for the observatory. And you see that it's also segmented into what is in the dome, the dome installation, um, what is in the cloud, what is the outside installation, and what is in the warm room. So we have a warm room, you have a dome section, and then you have the outside. And then we have this ominous cloud, uh, which is, I mean, the IT cloud. No. So, and, and the dome installation is basically just um, the optical part. And you see already on the optical part, there's a lot of connections, but the heart of it is the, the Eagle 5 Pro, where all the cables are end up. And from there, there are only four cables going out uh, uh, down into the warm room or on the floor. So, and I, I want to go, don't want to go into details, but what we do is like, we definitely have a VPN gateway, right? So basically this is creating for us uh, our own local area network in the, uh, private LAN, uh, where we can then dial in from the outside, which is very important. Uh, we are VPN, 
And then your computer, if you don't know what VPN is, basically uh, when you build up a VPN connection, your computer at home thinks it's physically there uh, in the network in Namibia. So basically you are then part of the local area network and can access all, all these devices with the IP addresses you see here. Um, we are not afraid to show these IP devices because uh, it's not so easy to get in in the VPN. Otherwise, it would be crazy. Um, but uh, then you see switches, and uh, we you also need quite some power management because all the power needs to be remotely switched on and off. Uh, you need that for multiple reasons. So we can come to that later in the Q&A maybe. And we have also a backup solution in case VPN doesn't work or we need quickly to check something. We have also zero tier network uh, built up, which is, uh, it's called zero tier in the OZ layer. It's not quite correct, but basically it it pops another network on top of your network. And you can basically add uh, any devices, uh, mobile phone, notebooks from any location in the world to that zero tier network. And they think they're in the same network. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. So you have a VPN network you're in the local area network, and then you have a zero tier and so on. Uh, it's maybe a bit overkill, but uh, we come to that later why we did this. Um, and then you have also some, uh, you see the all sky camera, the um, uh, the cloud watchers on the outside installation. Exactly. And we have a, a lot of sensors in there. So we have cameras, optical cameras that are watching the dome, that are watching the warm room. We have um, sensors for the sky. Uh, the cloud watcher and the Allsky camera. And then we have also um, computer watchers, basically. Uh, is the dome still working? Is the eagle working? Is the mount uh, still operational and stuff like that? So you have, and that makes it then complicated because it's a complex setup. Nobody's there, We but we constantly want to know what's going on. Um, so Let me just it up, yeah. show oh, yeah. this. That will help. <laughs> Yeah, so we call it Guardians of the Galaxy. Basically, we have a multitude of uh, watchers and sensors uh, installed. Some are obvious, all sky camera and cloud watcher everybody has. Some are not so obvious. Um, for instance, uh, the the Kuma. Uh, it's a free software, basically, where you can um, basically yeah script or at the devices you want to monitor. So it's a monitoring software, which runs in the Docker container outside of Namibia, but connected via VPN. And uh, there you can see we put every device that is pingable or in any form reachable in there. Uh, so we see what, what is up, what is down, and it gives you a report uh, and it's constantly watching. So if basically we are shooting and all of a sudden, um, the dome goes offline or it's not reachable anymore, then we get a pushover alert um, on our phones and on, on any devices where it's in, installed. So we use pushover, we use the uptime Kumar and some more things. And for, for the scope dome, we had also to build a watchdog. Um, I'm now a bit ahead of our slides, but we had <laughs> massive problems with the dome. So this dome, um, at least the version we got, <laughs> has uh, has this notion to just go offline in the middle of anything, just not reachable, um, not pingable, and it's just not reacting. Meaning if you continue shooting, you will start shooting against the dome, and that's not the purpose. So what we notice is what we need to do is to power cycle it, but you don't want to be there or watch the night because you want to go to sleep when it's shooting. So it needs to do it by itself. So we wrote our own watchdog basically on site. Um, uh, so we quickly hacked something in Python, which is basically not pinging it because it was pingable, but not reachable. So <laughs> we're just trying to log into the scoped home HTTP. And uh, when it was not, when it basically rejected uh, or was not reachable, then we had to lock into our um, energy new the, the switchable socket web interface, lock in programmatically and power cycle the dome, and then it was coming back up. So that was that was a quick hack we had to do. 
So, but all of this is, is basically connected and uh, it's also distributed to across three of us. So it's not just one guy who is watching. Basically, we did it uh, with multi-tenancy in our minds. So basically, everybody of us gets a pushover. Let's basically all hopefully wake up when something goes wrong. Mm. Yeah, and Nina also. So we are using Nina for shooting there. And, and Nina, you can also set up with this plug and ground station, the pushover alerts and other things in case of error or unsafe conditions. Yeah. However, when there's an unsafe condition, so the cloud watcher, which is it's directly connected to the dome, uh, will close the dome, even if the eagle is running or not. So uh, there's an extra cable just from the cloud watcher into the scope dome and it closes it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Some impressions. Yeah. Some impressions from the from the setting up. Yeah, you see this this red light is obviously in in the darkness. You can operate only under red light. Otherwise, the yeah the eyes are just uh, blended. And then maybe that's a bit uh, foreseen here. Uh, we have also success, and we were really happy. <laughs> But we will check out this issue list then also. To uh, Jens mentioned already some things, but uh, there were some more problems yeah. ahead. Yeah, we prepared also a list with all our equipment. If you have, yeah, if you're interested in astronomy equipment, that may be interesting. Uh, we mentioned already many things that we used, so I will just quickly go over that slide. That's not, uh, yeah, not too. Not too much in detail here. Uh, we mentioned the, the Richie Cartier. This is from GSO with some optimizations I did. So uh, different uh, collimation screws and so on. And two, I added two heaters to the scope, um, but not that much. Basically, it's the 12-inch Richie Cartier with the 0.8 reducer, which is important because we use a full-frame camera, the 6200mm, 60-megapixel camera, um, This needs definitely a full frame reducer. And this is capable of illuminate, illuminating the field properly. So um, that works very well. And also the proven uh, TS94 EDPH from Jens um, is working very good with a QHY 268M camera. Jens mentioned already the, the maxi filter wheel. Uh, that was really a, a bit struggling to find a filter wheel with more than seven positions and two inch diameter. That's not that easy. There are, I think, maybe three manufacturers worldwide that can produce such a filter wheel. And there is a price span from $1,000 to $5,000 for for such a filter wheel. So we went with Starlight Express, which is on the uh, on the budget side uh, of this list. And there are these fantastic Antlia filters and also the, the Ultra Series SHO. These are 2.5 nanometer filters, which enables us to shoot also under some moonlight and gives very sharp um, band pass uh, curves. We use a Big guiding camera, that's also worth mentioning, the 174mm from ZWO. This one is a, it comes in this one and a quarter inch socket or one and a quarter inch plug, uh, which you can put in uh, the off axis guider, but uses a very big sensor. And this enables us to find nearly all basic guide star. You, you have to remember we are shooting at 12, 2000 millimeter focal lengths. So finding a guide star is, uh, can be a problem if you use very small guide sensors with this 174mm that's working always. So we never had a problem with not finding a guide star. And we wanted to have a rotator in the system, in this uh, Richie Cretien system, because with this narrow field, Or, yeah, it is not really narrow with that full frame camera, but to be able to frame it properly, if you want to shoot a bigger target, like some sort of nebula, uh, you want maybe to frame it properly. And therefore we use this rotator from Wanderer Astro. Um, yes, I would say it's working now. We had some issues, 
combining all these things and the rotator was a bit problematic in the beginning, but I think, yeah, now it's working okay. Uh, oh, Jens, uh, Jan just left us. Uh, yeah, he mentioned that before that he had to go. No problem. Uh, the Eagle, we, yeah, we decided to go with the newest and I think that's the highest evolution uh, of the Eagle, the 5 Pro. Maybe second highest, but second but highest. Okay. Still. Uh, yes, that was a really expensive uh, piece of equipment that we had to to use. Uh, we wanted to have this eagle. <laughs> Hi, Jürgen. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Um, we wanted to have this eagle because we definitely needed to have a switchable power ports and switchable USB ports. Um, that is also crucial for a remote obs uh, observatory to uh, be able to switch off single parts. We have this Energini, this IP uh, socket, but this can only switch power supplies on and off. And is also limited to four switches. With that Eagle, you can find control. You can enable the camera if you want. You can enable a heater, a, a dew heater if you want. Um, so that's really nice uh, piece of equipment it's super racked it comes in a industrial housing and has also some more features like like a sky quality meter integrated uh, currently we don't use it really much but it's very nice to have but it comes with a very hefty price tag and we had to think about that way yeah for some calls i think the 10 micron we mentioned already sky or sky camera cloud watch all so software it is also yeah we mentioned that also nina is our central yeah imaging and control software because it is also connected to the dome and does the syncing uh, of the dome because you have to ensure or the system has to ensure that uh, everywhere where the scope is pointing the dome slit is pointing also and that was also yeah let's say one evening of adjustment because you have to set some parameters um that the scope yeah that, that there's no offset that is always pointing in the middle um pretty uh yeah it took some time but in the end it's working phd2 for guiding of course and all the other things that we mentioned python as our last a uh, quick fix that we had to do and up time kuma and zero tier and here that you have an impression how this looks like where we are so this we are in the in the Harkos mountains that that range is called Harkos mountains around that farm and it is some sort of desert there and uh, they built two observatories in, in one in, in, in one uh, approach, and the left the left one is already rented for some time, and the right one is ours, so to say. And we hope that we can stay there for a longer time. The problems. So here we have collected. Again, all the problems we had. We, we think that's really crucial to, to, to we stressed it, the topic uh, pretty much, but it is really crucial to know about possible problems. And it's, I think that's really good to, to have someone to, to tell the first hand experience that we had. So this is not just theory. We really face these problems. Um, I would say I maybe I start with the first ones, and then you. Yeah, we don't have to go through all of them, but uh, the the major one definitely the dome. But uh, what we want to show here is like be prepared for be prepared. And, and hey. it's it's if I can only stress, don't do it alone. <laughs> yes, because uh, it was in the end the complementary skills of all of us. Um, yeah. being able to fix them and the teamwork was fantastic I have to say uh, I wouldn't miss you guys uh, <laughs> so all the next observatories will be definitely with this team uh, and uh, and that your list of problems will be definitely different right so, so everybody's facing different problems but you will face problems so there's no such thing like you build it up 
it works. You go home and you smile. And yes. Yeah. Jens, that, that was a really uh, good topic. We, we should have uh, prepared a slide for that. Don't do it alone. That's absolutely right. Um, because there are always things you can't think about. Even in the planning, definitely not. You miss some things. Um, I can't recall the times we uh, go over that, that um, cabling slide that we have here. And everyone checked it again and again. And, oh, there's one missing and there's something else missing. And no, we want to connect it the other way. And so this this load of information and, and this concentration is uh, spread it onto three people, which is great. That helps everyone and helps to make things more reliable in the end. So that's also a point that I really want to highlight doing it with, yeah, more than alone. Yeah, but you're right. We, we don't have to go um, through all these things. The dome was a major problem because it was not used before. If uh, a dome is properly installed, so I, Really won't blame uh, the owners there. Friedhelm and Harkos are one. Uh, Friedhelm and Waltraud, I'm sorry, are wonderful people. We had a fantastic time there, and they were super helpful. Um, especially Friedhelm is a fantastic technician, so he solved. He can probably solve every problem. Um, he operates, uh, I think, 17 observatories now, so he has the knowledge. But yeah, we had to uh, fix these things because it was just not uh, operating before. And yeah. yeah, exactly. Software problems were also uh, pretty interesting. You see that PhD comes very often here. We had just problems. Uh, you, maybe you know it from, from home when you're doing it by yourself. Sometimes it's just not working. The calibration does not work or something happens and then you have to repeat the steps and go go back a step and do it again and yeah. yeah we wanted for instance drift the line uh to for, yeah. uh, for yeah. the polar line. Exactly. And to this day it did not work. Neither were we did different versions, it was always crashing for yeah. some reason. Right. I, I did this polar this drift alignment here at home regularly and no problems in there. A million times. Just yeah. um crashing PhD. Or another very interesting example. Uh it's oh I'm sorry. Uh, it's this one here. Sharpcap didn't know that we are in the south. So um you have the the option to polar line and sharp cap which goes super easy because it does this i don't know how it's called in sharp cap um, where you just rotate the scope a bit around the pole and it plate solves the image and then tells you the error it goes super fast but even when it is connected to the mount and it knows its position so its geographic location because it is uh, saved in the mount it does not use this information for that a polar alignment procedure. You have to check a yeah. box where you say it, you are north or south. And we just oversaw this, this little box. <laughs> I, I think the tricky part was that SharpCorp solved even the first picture. It said, yes, I know where you exactly. are. No rotate. You rotate. And then it says, I can't find any stars. That's uh, right. So that was the problem. Yeah. It solved it the, the image. So it knew we were looking at this celestial south, but uh, it didn't care much because the algorithm needs to be told you are in the south. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Um, some some uh, points about the gear, uh, the all the other gear. Um, for example, yeah, we, we mentioned that the RC was threatened pretty pretty badly. Um, so there were screws loosened while transporting it. So I prepared everything at home, but. When it arrived, the collimation was completely off. The secondary mirror was completely unscrewed. Um, we had, that's also a very uh, important point to know. We had one defective USB cable with us. So it was working before, of course, but when we installed it, it was just not working anymore. So you have to be also prepared for that to bring uh, spare parts with you just a simple USB cable when you are 140 kilometers or a four hour drive uh, far from the next um, electronic shop, then this is a real issue because you ha had to sp have to spend one day to 
to find a different USB cable. That's pretty, uh, pretty so, crazy. Luckily, we, we, we brought all redundant cables. Yes, so you brought, cable yes, cable. yes, you brought all the cables doubled. That was pretty cool. Yeah, all the other things are, um, I think, a bit more, more in detail here. I don't uh, want to go uh, only uh, to uh, to round it off. Right on the last day, on the last minute, <laughs> uh, when we opened the dome shutter, it derailed. Yeah. So basically, the shutter was getting out of the gears and fell basically backwards. And, right. Uh, that yes. Was very hard to fix. Yeah. So we had to first get it back in, uh, which is pretty heavy. And then we had to fix the problem. The, the problem was that the sensor, basically the stop sensor, was uh, getting it too late yeah. uh, to stop. And then the momentum was already too high and it went out of the rails. That was, so we had, yeah. Yeah. So we had to fix that with, with foam and uh, <laughs> cable straps and like something you don't want to ever use uh, to fix a problem. But uh, that was also. Uh, good teamwork because we had to all put our brains together how to fix this problem. Yes, uh, that's right. And the dome would be unusable uh, yeah. when we basically leave yeah. the scene. That was literally on the last day and it worked before. All the times before, no problem, but on this last yeah. opening, it was practically... The last opening where we just wanted to check if everything is okay. Then yeah. we go and sleep and go home. And then it happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. So in the end, we were thankful about that uh, that it happened then because otherwise we would never uh, get an idea because you can't yeah we can uh, turn maybe a camera to that uh, to that uh, slider to that shutter but um, you can't see the problem so we had to call uh, the guys there have a look and check it out and so on but so we were able to fix it before that was cool Yeah, okay. Now let's come to where to the really interesting thing. So um even when we were there, we were able to capture some data and then also when we were at home. And the first objects were yeah, some of the first objects I we want to show you here. It's really sad that I can't give you that in the full screen view because then it looks more dramatic. So um, as the first light, we decided to go more to the north to capture the Crab Nebula. I don't recall the exact imaging uh, times, but it is an SHO uh, integration, so narrowband integration. Uh, Jens, you... Ah, okay, you're back. All right. <laughs> And yeah, as you see, I think that's beautiful. That's just working. It is cropped, of course. It's heavily cropped. Uh, this RC produces, uh, I think, one degree of uh, field size. But the details are stunning here. That's working very well. Yeah, and for Jens and me, <laughs> at least, no, also for Sophie, we captured also a galaxy. We are, we are not, we are not finished with uh, that, uh, NGC 1365. We want to capture even more luminance here, but for the first, I'm not sure, I think eight hours or so, that is, yeah, that's just a fantastic target. It's, a really beauty in the sky and that's a real southern sky object i love it i just love it and to yeah to show a bit more of a standard object we went also to the tarantula tarantula nebula in the large Magellanic cloud and this was i think that was a rather short exposure just some hours but it is so bright and with that RC uh, honed in perfectly here, that was pretty awesome. And we are always, uh, here we are talking about a full 60 megapixel image. So the details are just stunning here. I will definitely get a poster from that. That is really cool. This is an OHS processing, I have to say, not the standard SHO where it would be more bluish. Uh, OHS processing here and yeah that's that's a beauty
Yeah, we have. We also want to thank Telescope Service <laughs> because they were supporting us a lot in getting this up and running, getting the gear. All right. So, yeah, uh, great team behind. <laughs> and also, we want to thank Harkos, the the team behind Harkos, because they were also not only the hospitality was great, also Free Term is a one man army. I can say, <laughs> yes, he's like a, he's really a brain. He, he knows construction. He knows astro. He knows networking. He's uh, he's everything. So yeah, <laughs> thanks to to both of you. <laughs> okay. Some of you might think, what's next? So in February we had our <laughs> observatory in Spain. In December, same year we had then our second observatory. <laughs> well, um, probably won't that... stop here. Uh, you see the trend line. Yeah, that um, looks like a trend. That, uh, <laughs> yes, it's a trend. <laughs> Uh, it's still linear though, but maybe we can work on that as well. And you see on the uh, right hand side, this is our Discord server, and the channel list has already JST2. So you can imagine we're already planning and talking. And uh, especially, I have to say, Sophie and, and Torsten are going super crazy about the next scope. So, yeah, But I won't spoil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much. Um, we put here a link to our Discord group, Dark Matters, right? So if you're interested uh, in joining this, um, we have a pl plentitude, uh, a multitude of really super good people that are friendly, that can help. Um, we have discussions, we have live streams also. We have every th Tuesday, we have, um, uh, how do you say, lectures or yeah, or just simply a talk about something. Uh, we talk about everything. So if you want to be part of that, please join us uh, there as well. It's mostly German speaking, I have to say. So, um, but uh, anyway, um, it's very useful. Yeah. And also, Grexpert, if you know the software, is also born there. And we we are now one thousand seven hundred members strong. So, yeah. I'm already doing some advertisement here, but unfortunately, the, the camera is too high. You can't see it. <laughs> and you probably saw it on the pictures and the shirts. We always have our dark metal shirts on. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's really... I, I have to say that's really a great community. I'm not super active there, um, but especially these uh, talks there and image discussions. Um, I'm not sure if you know Frank Sackenheim. He's also very active there. That's great uh, to learn things, to ask questions, um, mostly German speaking, but, you know, astro astronomers, astrophotographers should be able to understand also English. So, yeah, I have also to, to thank you for... Yeah, that's fantastic experience. Uh, if someone had told me in the beginning of last year that I would end up end up the year with a remote observatory in Namibia, I would say he's crazy. But no, it just became true, and that was really great. And I'm also looking forward to this observatory and maybe some newer ones. <laughs> okay, so then we. Got through this. Great. Yeah, that was not so perfect that it no, was not um, going into the full screen here. Now I can close it and I bring back the. I have some questions though. Yeah, sure. Um, as I'm going remote myself too, um, I found this presentation very helpful, but I'm interested in why do you need like Jens? I think he said that it's kind of necessary to have a like um, switch, a switcher when you can turn on and off USB connection and power. Uh, I, I mentioned that, yeah. Yeah. So wh why is that important? And like, what is a like a small one that can do that work for you? Uh, like if there's a small um, <clears throat> component that you know of, like uh, uh, that I could use, I'm getting a much smaller telescope than you, remote. Yeah. But uh, uh, is there any like small boxes that can do that work for you? And like, how much does it cost? Yeah. So for the power switching, you need that 
if, especially if you have something like the eagle or or like a melee, right? So you need to power off, you you need to power it off and power it on, on after the session, um, and then uh, uh, you you configure the BIOS that it uh, boots on power loss. So basically, it comes up. Uh, this is the from there. Basically, there are multiple boxes that can do a, the rest of the power switching for you if you want to do. Right there, are these Pegasus Astro power boxes. There are also the new ones from Wondera has also now some, and uh, but in in general, you need to be control the power because sometimes devices crash and you can only boot them up by powering on and off. Like uh, some mounts, you also need to power on and off, right? Um, because you don't want to keep everything on, and. Uh, yeah, and if you have Raspberry Pis lying around for ASKs or something else uh, as well. For the USB powering, I find almost even more important because sometimes your COM ports are getting completely mingled up, right? So all the Astro devices are using serial ports, uh, COM 1 to 15, and we are using up, I think we have eight COM ports. And sometimes when they're mixed up, they get conflicts and then they are not responsive anymore. What you need to do is like, Somebody needs to plug out the USB cable and plug it back in. It gets reassigned a new COM port and then works again. But as nobody's there, it's easier if you can do it programmatically. And the Eagle provides such a thing. And there are probably also others that can do that. What this... you could do if, if you don't have it is you put them on a powered USB hub and then you can power on and off the USB hub and then all the USB devices will come back in. That is also a possibility. But Switchable power is uh, is almost a must. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, for example, if I have a DC hub and a USB hub together, um, is it okay if I just like switch it on and off, and that should work, right? Yes, in theory, it, it should work. Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll for sure test it out, and yeah. 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 Mm. There, is. there are some USB hubs which not really. Um, reset the connection if, uh, if you cut the power. Um, then you really have to test it out. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah. there needs to be, uh, it needs to be a USB hub when it doesn't have power, it also cuts the connections. Mm -hmm. Some others just switch into passive mode. Yeah, instead of exactly. Mode and then the connection yeah. is still there. Um, yeah, but th that can happen. Okay. In our Spanish observatory, it happens very often because we have also the flat panels and some other devices. And Deep Sky Dad has a very weird way of writing drivers. So there we often have to switch off the power of the USB devices. Okay. Thank you. I've got some questions, uh, Torsten. Sure. Um, so first of all, I'm super impressed you got this done in seven days. Okay. Um, <laughs> really amazing. Um, have there been any problems since you left? Um, or is everything working smoothly? There is currently one problem, um, thankfully only one, and this is that the shutter will not open sometimes. So there's just an ASCOM command we sent with the driver, open shutter, and it will not reach. The, the shutter is connected via Bluetooth to the, to the dome control, and we believe that this connection is sometimes interrupted. We're not sure if we have, to, we then have to rotate the dome and test five to six times and sometimes or then the shutter will open this is highly unreliable especially if we sometimes want to completely automate the the procedure from opening to closing that's just not working currently so we have to do it by hand because we have to repeat it um, but otherwise i would say no that's working really well so we have now, I think, 30 hours integration time with many testing and so on. Uh, so not really useful data uh, sometimes, but no problems at all. And yeah, on-site support. I mean, you, you mentioned that the, the, the owner or the, the guy, the main guy there is basically a jack of all trades. And he's like running 17 observatories, I think you mentioned. Um, yes. Which is a huge job. So how, what's the turnaround time? So if something falls over that needs to be reconnected or? He is pretty fast. So, um, I'm not sure how it is in the, in the summer when he, or in, in, in June, uh, 
when, when there is main season with guests. So maybe then he is a bit more busy, but otherwise he also tracks uh, the opening state in the morning so uh, he then writes to, to a whatsapp group here there's a uh, there's a roof still open what should i do um so he is really active maybe not if something breaks at 2 a.m in the night sure but uh, over the day over the next day he definitely can do something the bigger problem is if something is really a defect for example um another guy had a defective eagle then there's just no way yeah, to fix this. Easy. So he has to send the eagle down there. But uh, the guy there can install it, so he can do all these things. But yeah, you can't get spare parts in Namibia. No, no, no. no, no. Mm. But you can send gear down, and he'll install it for you. Yes, yes. that's yes, right. Yeah. Okay. And he's very knowledgeable about computers, optical instruments. So, so, right. so okay. an interesting fact: he built these roll-off roofs. The the most uh, the most part of the observatories are roll of roofs. Uh, there are only a few domes, and he built them by itself, by himself. So at least the electronics. I'm not sure about the mechanics, but yeah, he can can do this. Yeah. So then, of course, yeah. it, you know, he's one guy. So if he ends up in hospital, what happens? Yes, that is indeed uh, something they considered. So there's uh, another guy basically following his footstep. Um, Yes. Right. So they, they they have a second in command, but still, yes, it's it's a valid question. Uh, yeah. At the moment, everything mm. hangs on this guy, and everybody yeah. is afraid yeah. that something happens to him. Yeah. And then my last question: I noticed you're using Nina three, so presumably that's the beta, that's sort of like yes. the update. Yeah. Uh, any problems with that so far? Because I've had yeah. some issues with it. Um, I, I've been playing around with it a bit, uh, and I have had some issues. Oh, what what kind yeah. of issues? Um, it's related to turning off, um, you know, with PhD two. Um, so at the end of the at the end of the session, you want to turn the mount off. So you turn the mount off, um, either with the eagle or you know, I'm using both the, an eagle on one one system and I'm using a Pegasus Astro kit on the other. So I turn, I switch the mount off, um, but of course it doesn't go off it only goes off in nina because phd is still running so oh. there is now a plugin for nina which allows you to basically shut down phd2 uh, within nina um, and that solves that problem and i've had issues with that so I mean, that's the, I mean that's the reason why why i installed um, um, nina 3 but i've reverted back to nina 2 now it wasn't working oh. properly. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, but look, it I mean, the, all these things are going to be yeah. solved within the name within the coming months. I mean, I, when yeah. is the release date of Nina? The sort of stable release dates uh, projected for Nina three? He, Stefan, didn't mention. Uh, he said it's finished when it's finished. <laughs> this is how right, it yeah. works. So he's not giving dates. Um, he was not even planning to put it in better yet, but he, he did it now because he thought it's pretty stable. We actually wanted to use only Nina 2, but unfortunately, mm. the 10 micron tools were not working anymore in Nina 2, so we had to switch to Nina 3. And uh, so far, everything is working, but yeah, we didn't have much edge yeah. cases yet. Yeah. So it's just operational since 63 hours uh, capturing time. So 63? So say, yeah, we have 63. Okay. Yeah. Nice. But it's all in the Excel sheet. I'm logging everything. Yeah, day. yeah, right, right. Yes. So, but I, I think Nina 3 is fairly stable. Yeah, in some edge cases, it's not working for everyone, but I hope uh, that will work. Okay. And, and the plugins are pretty powerful. Maybe something we haven't answered yet the data is huge, and uh, connections to Namibia are not fast. It's also something you need to consider. Um, so what we are doing is we are automatically syncing uh, the data into a cloud over the day, not overnight, because the bandwidth is shared. Uh, they don't have gigabit Ethernet there. It's uh, all shared bandwidth. And so over the day, basically, it's slowly synced into the cloud. Uh, but this is also done automatically. Yeah, that was that was actually my next question is what what is there to 
Is, do they have fiber or do they no. have satellite? No. No. satellite they, they, they have actually just a Vimex bridge uh, to a cell tower. So basically, it's uh, there's not even a cable there. So they there's a telecom tower, I think, a few kilometers off, and they have basically a Wi-Fi bridge. And from there, it's a Wimax bridge to the next tower. And from there, it's cable to Windhoek. Yeah, so it's similar to what we have um, in the Cedarburg. And the problem that we have there actually is is more to do with the wildlife. Sometimes, sometimes baboons climb up the, to the top of the tower, and then they mess with the aerials. So um, <laughs> you lose the you lose the the, the line of sight. The, the um, monkeys are really a problem. Time. That's also why you have to close the dome in the morning, not because of the rain. It's because <laughs> the monkeys are coming and they are climbing, yeah. up, climbing up the dome. Yeah. yeah. But um, that was a great connection, Peter. Let's talk a bit more about Cedarburg, if you yeah, want. I was going to say, uh, Torsten, I'm very sorry, but I have to leave in about two minutes. Um, oh, my God. A message to the group. Um, oh, I'm really sorry. Maybe leave that for the next session, possibly. Yes, I would love to. Okay. Fine. Sure. Yeah, we will do that. Okay. okay perfect. <laughs> so thank okay. you very much for joining. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have yet another question. Yeah, uh, sure. It's not a specific, but it's about the Wanderer uh, data that you use. <laughs> like what, what? I saw that there was an issue with it, but just want to know what was the issue with it. Like I saw something with the off-axis guider, but not sure. How yeah, it so meant. we are not sure what happened, but uh, basically we teached in, in the, the Wanderer the the rotating limits, right? Because uh, we didn't have 360. We had only like, I think, 200 degrees of, of freedom because then the off-axis guider is uh, hitting the... What is it hitting? The, not the rotator, but something else. The filter anyway. wheel. The filter, the filter wheel, wheel. Yeah. exactly the filter wheel. Yeah, it's hitting the filter wheel, and it we did it and was working. And next day, I think it forgot its limits, or it was resetting its position. Uh, so it, it didn't forgot its limits, but it reset its position back to zero while it was on eighty three or something. And then it, it was turning, and what it did is like the off axis guider was then shaved off at the filter wheel. So what I can say, the wonder is very strong. <laughs> it was okay. not stopping. It was just going, and then you, your office get like, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. It was a scary but moment. Otherwise, but it, it didn't uh, happen wonders. before, uh, and not again. So we don't know what what exactly happened, and I hope it's not happening again because we won't see it. Yeah, but uh, otherwise the wonder is good, like, right? Like no yeah, tilt yeah. and it's strong, precise, and... strong, yeah. And it's very thin. Yeah, this is it's the, one of the thinnest with 12 millimeter optical path. That's That was also the reason why we choose that one. That's the only one which is fitting in our image train. Cool. I might get it too for my system in Spain. So yeah, that's why I'm asking. Okay. Yeah, please get it. Then we can troubleshoot together. Okay. <laughs> nice. Okay, so um, yeah, unfortunately, Peter had to left. Um, we will uh, give his speech in the next um, session that we do. Yeah, then we are at the end of today's session. No other questions are coming in. Uh, if there's something unclear, uh, feel free to drop a comment below the video afterwards. That's no problem. Um, we are still online so thank you all for this nice evening it was great to to talk again about our project <laughs> and yeah maybe there's uh also some some time uh, where we can do another speech with new results that we had or new projects <laughs> whatever so until then if we see you next in our next live session have a great time until then Cheers. Bye-bye.